Good evening. Thanks for joining us once again for another Cleveland Public Library, the next 400 digital discussion on racial justice and equity. Chris Tanaka from 19 News moderating as always. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. As you are well aware, February and every month is Black History Month. And something so fascinating that 19 News and the Cleveland Public Library have done this February in particular is focus on living history. In the past, each of our organizations and institutions have had historical perspectives, examinations, spotlighting uh, change makers from the past and those who have accomplished. Well, this year with Living History, we're looking and meeting those who are accomplishing. And I'm so excited for this conversation in particular, but because it allows me, uh, an old man, <laughs> to talk to some fascinating young individuals who are making Cleveland a better place and ask them not only about what they're doing, what inspires them and the organizations they're representing tonight. So without further ado, let's start introducing our guests. First, uh, representing 12 Literary Arts, Keith Benford, a fascinating young man, 21 years old, full of life, energy, and a lot of talent. Uh, representing EYEJ, in case you don't know, Empowering Youth, Exploring Justice, is McClellan Cox, uh, a ripe old age of 29, and Trey Gray at 19, uh, both of them with this extraordinary organization that was born uh, a little less than a decade ago. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm so excited. Now, let's just go around uh, clockwise. Keith, uh, as, as we unmute your mic in this digital space, uh, how did you get involved and what is 12 Literary Arts for those uh, who are unfamiliar? Word, word. Um, hello, my name is Keith J. Benford, AKA Keith Benford Jr. Um, I, 12 Literary Arts is a, is a literary arts um, nonprofit that is focused on empowering and uplifting uh, black voices, uh, people of, voices of people of color, and also really just a minority voices as well. We uh, support the LGBTQ plus community, um, and just we're, we're really uh, advocates for minority voices. Um, yeah. and, and we also are uh, doing a lot of community outreach as well. That's something that we've been doing in the past, I think two years now, and we've been getting a lot of traction and success in that. Um, and we also do a lot of uh, other ventures in art as well when it comes to music. Uh, we just had an album executive produced by my boss, Daniel Gray Contar. Uh, called In Search of the Land, which is an uh, album made up of completely local artists. So we do a lot of things. We're a jack of all trades as a as an organization. Uh, I think uh, for me, the way I got involved, actually, I've known a lot of the staff at 12 Literary Arts since I was a child. Um, Daniel, the, Daniel used to work at Cleveland School of the Arts, where I graduated, and he taught my older sister. Um, he When they started doing community outreach, they happened to be doing it in my neighborhood, which is Huff. And one of my friends called me up. He was like, hey, you know, they're doing something in your neighborhood, right? Maybe you should like talk to them about that. <laughs> and here we are, uh, I think two years. Dang, it's been like almost two years now. Here we are almost two years later. Um, and I've been helping them facilitate different um, artistic events, also helping them facilitate community conversations as well. So it's been it's been a really dope two years working with them. It's, and I believe it because Daniel is such an incredible individual. He was actually a panelist for one of our earlier discussions about black representation in entertainment. And when I reached out to him about this month, uh, he could not sing your praises enough. So uh, so glad to meet you. <laughs> and then I reached out to my Moore at EYEJ and she spat out names uh, in the organization just as quickly. McClellan, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, introduce people to the organization and yourself. Sure, thanks, Chris. So again, my name is McClellan Cox. Uh, by day, I'm an attorney at the law firm of Ulmer and Byrne here in Cleveland. Uh, but I also have the opportunity to work uh, for EYEJ on their Millennial Task Force. So essentially, EYEJ is an organization that gives students a platform to attack social justice issues in their community. It, it gives them a forum to have thought provoking conversations about some of the issues that affect them and their communities. Uh, and then within the Millennial Task Force, which is an organization that I'm a part of, 
we are a group of young millennial professionals, some in college, some working professionals, and we use our skill sets as a group that's a little bit older than the general body of UIJ to help the students in terms of uh, fundraising initiatives, uh, strategic planning, and things of that sort. So uh, we work in tandem with the students in EYJ and some of their initiatives to help them uh, have the funds and resources that they need and also provide that you know, millennial perspective in terms of the work that needs to be done in their communities. Yeah, and, and it's fascinating to me, you know, as a 29 year old uh, and highly accomplished already, um, earning your JD and working in law, um, to be able to mentor at what I would consider to be uh, such a young age is fascinating. And yet here you are still very young, but you are across a generational bridge from say Treya, who at 19 uh, and involved in the organization is the younger youngest member of our group. Treya, you are involved in a lot. You're interested in a lot. Uh, why don't you tell everybody some of the stuff that takes up your time and some of the passions and what, what brought you to EYEJ? Um, I got involved with EYEJ like two years ago. Um, I came in because I saw it on my friend's social media and I was like, ooh, I want to do that. So um, what I'm doing, well, I started off as like the social media manager doing merch and stuff. And then what had happened was um, my the EYEJ uh, youth council director had left, so my offered me the job to be the youth council manager, and I said yes. So currently, right now, I'm running the youth council um, with my and my colleagues. Um, some things that we do that we focus on are policy, social policy, research, youth voice. Big on youth voice, obviously, because the whole organization is based around giving youth a a voice and I feel like Maya does an amazing job at that making sure that we're put in positions that we wouldn't normally be put in like um currently we're focusing on the digital divide which is basically the um difference between people with internet and technology and without internet and technology some things that we've done with that is like um we went down to Columbus to testify against um House Bill 13 um and then we passed out hotspots we have so much stuff going on with the social media, just stuff like that. So that's what I do. That's who I am. <laughs> and at 19 years old, I mean, I was, I considered myself just trying to get out of bed and lace my shoes up. And yet here you've already been involved. How, and I, and I, I, I marvel at your generation, at Gen Z, at millennials, uh, the involvement the civic duty, uh, the sense of community awareness and pride. Where did this come from? Like it's like I said, I'm barely able to tie my shoes and wake up and get to class at your age. Where was the inspiration? Where did it come from? Was there a singular event? Was it a trauma? Was it something uplifting? Trail, let's start with you. Um, me personally, I think that um, outside factors affected me definitely. Like I don't want to. I don't like the way that black youth is treated nowadays, obviously, where it's a lot going on. So um, I had to get involved. Definitely when the Black Lives Matter thing started happening with like all the looting and everything is when I really got involved because I just hate seeing the oppression. Like, I, it's terrible. I'm tired of it. We're tired of it. So I was like, somebody has to do something. So that's why I was like, I'll be the one to actually do something. That's why I'm involved. Incredible. What about you, Keith? Um, yeah, this is a, this is a big one for me. Uh, I think the best way I can explain is, uh, out of a verse out of the Bible, pretty much is, uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 1, it says, um, and I looked at the tears of all the oppressed and there was no one there to comfort them. The hand of power was in their oppressors and there was no one to comfort them. Um, I read that at a very young age. I read that I was, when I was like 12 or 11 and no, I was 13. I'm, I lied. I was 13. And after I read that, it kind of gave me a new look on how I see people as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. It really showed me, it, it gave explanation to what I was seeing around me. You know, I grew up uh, in, in in Huff, which is, you know, still, it's, it would be considered a rough neighborhood. Um, so, you know, we see a lot. And I kind of looked at my own situation. I was, I'm one of the uh, I'm so there's a statistic that uh, in Huff where it's like I think it was um 
something like uh, one in three, one in four uh, are above the poverty line in my neighborhood, at least at one point. And I was like, and I'm and I'm that one that's above the poverty line. So I look around and see my peers and I'm just like, yo, we all need help. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, like what, what am I doing to help the people that's around me? So that was kind of the thing that I was seeing. I was just seeing oppression on so many different levels. Um, and also as an artist, I got to see people a lot. Um, I'm an actor and I've been an actor since I was a child. So um, I get to see, uh, I get to meet a lot of people and talk to a lot of people and hear what they're going through and see what, what their, what, where their minds and where their heads are at. So that's kind of like my consistent um, inspiration. It's just trying to see, trying to find a better way to help people uh, feel better about their situation and just a better people's situation in a very tangible and real way. Yeah. Similar to what Trey is doing. Absolutely. And, you know, similar yet different, right? Uh, you're both getting involved with community organizations that are focused on uplift, up, uplift, excuse me. Um, yeah, with 12, obviously there's a, a, an artistic uh, bent to it. Um, and of course, McClellan, uh, man, at 29, you've already, when did you earn your JD? Was it like undergrad straight to law school and, and then here you go? It was. And what made you uh, earn a JD? My sister's an attorney, and I love hearing origin stories of people deciding they wanted to uh, torture themselves for three years and then try and pass the bar. <laughs> sure. No, yeah. Um, I think I always uh, saw myself being a lawyer. Um, but, you know, I, I, growing up, my, my, my family and my parents would always say, man, you sure like to argue a lot. You should go be a lawyer. So, you know, that was something that was, I think I was always predestined to, to do. Uh, but kind of addressing the question that, that you asked previously, you know, I remember pretty vividly when uh, the Trayvon Martin situation happened. Uh, I, I, he was, you know, maybe a few years uh, younger than I was. So when I hear, when I heard and, and saw that situation unfold, I saw myself, right? Um, and so while I had had, you know, an inkling that I might want to go to law school, Situations like that kind of, that was, I would say, maybe the catalyst for me wanting to actually go and pursue that. Um, and so going to college and, and graduating from college uh, and applying to law school uh, straight after uh, college, I began to, as I read the cases and kind of studied the law, not only did I see kind of where we've come as a country in terms of, you know, civil rights and, and some of the, the things that have happened through policy and through the law, uh, it, it kind of awakened in me this thought that, you know, the change that we need, the change that we want to see in this community is going to happen through policy, through the through law and through policy. And so that's kind of what brought me to, to EYJ uh, as, a, as a lawyer who's young. And one of the big things that young lawyers try to do is to join, you know, different organizations and possibly join boards and using their, 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 uh, their experience to help the community. When I heard about EYJ, which is an organization that allows young people uh, to to you know affect change through policy, and when I learned that I could be a part of that as a young lawyer, I thought it was just a perfect marriage, and I was excited to become a part of it. Yeah, it, and it is remarkable, you know, activism, uh, as we just said, takes on all forms, and it's a battle that's fought on many fronts: uh, policy, law, affecting change. Uh, I think we've seen this as a nation, how different states are trying to steer, right, uh, their own policy through voting and access. Um, so I find it remarkable that you were able to identify that uh, at such a relatively young age, and you're now in a position where you're really helping uh, young people find their voices. I can't help but think as I sit here and I speak with all of you and I listen so intently that there's a part of me that perhaps laments the fact that this awareness that you all have could potentially be taking away from some of your innocence of youth. What would you say, Keith, you're nodding, so I'm going to dive in with you. What would you say to that as, you know, me, a Gen Xer who came, I'm not a digital native, right? I had my first cell phone when I was 25. I see you. I'm proud of you. Uh, I want to be part of, of the good that you do. 
but I lament the fact that you might not be able to be as, as young and, and naive as I was. What do you say? Um, yeah, I was, I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately, especially getting into this work. Um, yeah, I think that a lot of, uh, because we have so much access to information, like we can get literally information from anywhere about anything at any time in the matter of a second. Um, and you know, I, that's a lot of power to have, uh, at my age. Uh, and you see what people, different people are doing with this. Some people are kind of, um, some people are kind of like, you know, seeing the information and actually deciding to make a change about it, or deciding to act on what they're learning or apply what they're learning. But I think for people that are extra young, you know, it's just like we're getting exposed to so much trauma all the time. Uh, it's getting to the point where I've seen not just people in my generation, but the generation under me, which worries me even more. Um, people are starting to see a only only having a negative view of their reality because we are exposed to negativity in the blink of an eye. Like if I were to go on my phone right now and look through Instagram and I would see, oh, some another black person died, whether it be by the hands of the cops or whether it be by somebody that got shot just um, going doing their rounds in the hood. Like it's whatever, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, and it's and there's so much more stuff like that that's being that's being exposed to us at such a young age. I'm I'm seeing uh children, people that are 15, 14, uh, they're they're def they're defining their lives through politics only. Yeah. These are not issues of these, not every single issue that we're seeing is a political issue. These are morality issues. Okay. And it's like, I feel like with so much information and no guidance to kind of guide us through all the avenues of what we're, we have access to is getting to the point where, um, it's getting to the point where I feel like we can be like walking around with chickens with our heads cut off. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, we are exposed yeah. to so much information that we don't know what to do. So we just kind of desensitize and become neutral. And I'm seeing a lot of that in my generation and the generation of, uh, under me. And it's really bothering me. Trey, does that, does that ring similar to you as far as having part of your youth? You know, I don't know if taken away would be the right word, but growing up faster than maybe previous generations? Um, yeah, but I feel like it's in a different way. So like personally, um, I feel like black females are looked at, they, they're forced to grow up faster. Like, they'll be like oh this little girl she has um like she has a she's going up fast and she her body's developing faster so she's fast and then we're portrayed as like i feel like that's a that's a good example that points to what i'm trying to say but i don't know how to put it into words if that makes sense sure um sure. like we're forced to go up faster because we see the oppression and then we don't see it as the same as people who are not min minorities um like we're forced to look at, we're automatically forced to look at the world like okay if you go out and this happens like we're are we already know about racism we're already taught about it and it seems like in white households it's, it's probably maybe it's not talked about and that's not that's not their main concern because when they walk out the house they're not going to be oppressed but that's something that we worry about every single day when we walk out the house um anywhere we go it doesn't matter so is your involvement then um the way you deal with it is it is it perhaps a, a an outlet coping mechanism uh, a way to fight back against this just being sure to educate and make sure that people understand um what they're doing and how they're doing it doing it because like i said people might not understand that they are um offending you or oppressing you because that's just how things are yeah hey mcclellan as a young millennial but not a Gen Zer. What difference do you notice between your peers in your generation and and Gen Zers uh, like Keith and Trey? You know, uh, outside of EYEJ, I have the opportunity to teach at uh, Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Uh, the Black Law Students Association's mock trial team. And I have students who are, I wouldn't quite say they're 
they're, they're kind of in between the millennial and Gen Z or they're, they're probably about four to five years younger, younger than me. But yeah. I would say, you know, what I'm seeing with them and what I'm seeing with uh, young people like Treya are, you know, this sense of, uh, this more heightened sense of urgency perhaps than we had when, uh, as kids, um, it, it's, it's remarkable, you know? And, and I think, uh, I think the social climate sometimes creates a sense of urgency. Uh, so when you see the black lives matter movement and you see, you know, you know, things like, you know, the police brutality and, and police killings, when you hear about things that, that are affecting Gen Zers, you know, like the digital divide or food insecurity, uh, and there's heightened awareness to stuff like voter suppression. I think it, it creates a fire in them. And, and to Keith's point, um, with the access of, of information that they have, uh, that just kind of throws it at them through Instagram, through Twitter, through Facebook, I think it just it creates that fire in them that 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 makes them, you know, say, hey, you know, I, I really want to do something about this. And, and, and let's be clear about this. You know, I think that this whole notion of young people kind of diving into into action at a young age, it's not anything new. I mean, we think about the Jim Crow and you think about the civil rights movement and people like John Lewis, who were who were, you know, the late great John Lewis, who were who are young college students who are getting on buses to go down to the South to march and to protest and to sit in, right? So I think it's 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 a part of the, the black experience for young people to be so enthralled and wanting to, to, to jump in the movement and affect change. And I think that's what we're seeing with uh, millennials, but especially uh, the, the young people in Gen, Gen Z as this information is kind of being thrown at them through, through social media. Yeah, you know, I, look, there are some days where uh, I unplug entirely and for, you know, from the digital world entirely, not just social media, but you know, keeping those notifications at bay because there's such mental health toxicity to it. I can't even imagine the stressors it puts on young adults and teenagers to have to navigate this world when so much is thrown at you uh, unendingly. Right. It's it's it seems overwhelming, which um, only adds to my respect for all of you to be able to do what you do at such a tender age. Um, one thing I want to make sure to ask is, you know, McClellan, we see you as being established. Uh, you are obviously an educator. You are a mentor in your roles. You've taken this on where you're uh, helping bring along younger minds. With Treya and with Keith, because you're in it, how do you interact with your peers when you're heading off to EYEJ? Or, you know, it's a it's a Friday or Saturday night, or maybe it's a Sunday and you got a big day coming up. Um, and, you know, some of your friends may not be in invo as involved with you. Is there any sort of recruitment? Is there any sort of uh, involvement that you try um, to get your friends and your peer group involved, or do you surround yourself with those who already are? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. I think uh, I've uh, done a decent job of surrounding myself uh, with uh, other individuals who care about this particular cause. Uh, yeah. For example, I'm a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, uh, which is you know the first Black Greek letter organization uh, in, in the United States, uh, and you know that's part of the fabric of the fraternity, which is you know uh, being involved in the in the social movement uh, in, in some of these issues that affect our communities. And so, a lot of my fraternity brothers are are right there with me, you know. Uh, and and some of the things that I envision going forward is to be able to collaborate with fraternity EYJ or other organizations that I'm a part of, like the 100 Black Men of Greater Cleveland, and being able to collaborate with EYJ so that you know we can fight the fight right alongside them, right? And so you know, I think that um, I've been fortunate enough to kind of put myself in a position where the folks who I associate with, you know, are, are, are on board with, with helping, you know, the cause that, you know, Treya and Keith have taken up, have taken up. Yeah. Keith, Treya, jump in. What about your peer groups? Do you try and get them involved? Are they involved? 
me personally, I was already, I was taught to be around the people that you want to be like. So I honestly, my friend groups, we all work towards the same things, but we do different things. So like, um, it's always, if one of us are down, one of us helps each other get back up. Basically, we all have the same type of goals. You have to be around the people that are moving the same way that you are or that where you want to be because if you're around people that aren't doing good you're obviously going to start acting like them too so you have to be around people that you want to be like basically is what i'm saying so if they're not helping me grow or contribute to my goals then they're not going to be around me period i love that social decisiveness keith i like that i like that i like that energy trait um for me uh yes yes um for me uh my activism has been most prevalent in my art um i'm a multifaceted artist i've been an artist for a really long time like 10 years now um so for me i'm always trying to figure out new and creative ways to influence people to uh, have a more higher consciousness uh, of what's going on around them and i surround myself around artists um that's kind of like how I, I roll. Um, and in that space, I see a lot of perspective. I get to see different, um, I get to see different um, looks on the same thing that I'm looking at. Um, it, for me, it provides empathy and for me, it provides uh, understanding. And I surround, my I surround myself with people who are similar. Um, in terms of encouragement or recruitment, I always encourage my friends to um I really encourage to encourage them to uh take hold of what matters and is important to them. Usually it's a, it's the same things, but you know, some people have have different looks on what they want to make a statement on or want to take action in. And I'm just like no matter what you do, take action in it because at the end of the day, if you're just talking, that's all it'll be. You know? Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of the way that I roll. Uh, I don't try to force anyone to do anything in particular, but if they so hap just so happen to come to an event and they just so happen to find their way into some type of philanthropy, then you know God is good. <laughs> Amen. Absolutely. No, no, please straight dive in. Oh, I just wanted to say that I think that's really cool. I'm also an artist. I'm a photographer and I'm also an arts major. Yeah, we have to connect after this. For surely. I just wanted to say that I'm an artist too. You should see my Instagram and everything, but yeah. I'm <laughs> Jeezy. Uh, Chris, can I, can I ask a question yeah. real quick? Yeah, of course. So Treya, how have, um, how long have you been an artist? I feel like I've been doing art since I was little. Like this is the only thing that I haven't put down. Hmm. So have you, have you gotten a chance to find intersections between your work and your art yet? What do you mean? <laughs> so, like, for example, um, we're, there's uh, this thing, this saying that uh, Daniel talks to me about, call it, it's about um, adding truth to power or something, something to that effect. Um, pretty. So, for example, have you, like, gotten the chance to, like, draw a mural or, like, express what you're doing oh with gosh, your work? Yes, through art? Blase, blase. yes we paint, I painted a mural in 2019. I think I don't know, but it was some sometime. It's in Van Aiken, um, in the Walgreens drive-through. If you guys want to go look at it, um, it's it was basically we basically uh, did it about because this is when the Black Lives Matter stuff started, and we wanted to make it all about Black Lives Matter. And then we have it was like a whole affair because it was a whole video. It was actually a whole big thing because <laughs> I like outed them. And like they wouldn't let us put Afrocentric features on the walls, and I was arguing with them. I was like, "There's no reason that we can't put Afrocentric features on the wall. It's just because you guys are used to European features and blah blah blah." And then I had outed them on the the little video thing, and I got in trouble for it. But then people were supporting me, so it's okay. But yeah, <laughs> this is I, I love this. My smile is gonna break the size of my cheeks. We've had so many of our panelists in the past say this exact same thing that the you two are saying hey we got to connect after this and once we pull the digital blinds down on the screen absolutely uh we will share information by all means because trey it sounds like you need to connect with 12 uh for sure and and and, and really make that artistic outlet flourish um i love this discussion and keith i love what you were saying about um people kind of living passionately 
and finding their voice. I want to be able for each of you um, to talk about how individuals who might be curious uh, to get involved, whether it's artistically, uh, civically, whatever, how they may find your organizations. McClellan, why don't you go uh, first, tell people how they can find EYEJ and not be intimidated. Uh, and a final thought on, on living history and all of you incredible young individuals uh, working to make your communities better and the city of Cleveland better in this country, Becky. Sure. So yeah, um, one of the things that is you know amazing about UIJ is that it has a very, very robust uh, social media campaign in terms of all the ways that it likes to communicate or uh, connect with the community. So I mean, uh, and, and, and Trey, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's Twitter, there's Instagram, there's Facebook, you know, obviously there's a website that you can go to and, you know, uh, our, our Instagram, I mean, if, if, if you were to, if someone wants to, to join UIJ and they literally sent a DM to any one of the social media platforms, you know, that same day, almost, you'd probably get a, a, a um, a notification back from from the account telling you how to get involved telling you how to become a part of whether it's you know from a student perspective in terms of joining uh whether it's from a millennial perspective and serving on the millennial task force so i mean the social media outlet and and and, and Trey, if maybe you could uh, provide the handles I, I can't remember them off the top of my head right now go ahead give them give them to them real quick the social media for Okay, so it's EYEJ Cleveland, and then the other one is um, EYEJ Youth Council. So that's the Instagram. So I don't, I'm not sure what the other ones are, but you can DM us because um, my co lead runs the um, the Instagram Carrington, so she'll respond to you guys. Yeah, and so I mean, I think uh, for for the future generation of, of change makers, and that's kind of what we talk about at EYJ is change makers. You know, I, I would just personally say, you know, there's never uh, too early of a time to get involved, right? Um, whether it's through art, whether it's through music, whether it's through writing a letter to your congressman or congresswoman, you know, it's never too early to get involved. Uh, and I think that, you know, starting young is actually important because, you know, as you as you grow and as you develop, you know, it gives you a, a broader perspective of what's going on in your community. And so by the time you're my age, you know, you, you've been in the game for a long time and you're able to give back and reach and kind of use your, whether it's your education or whether it's your experience to kind of help further the movement. And so I, I, I would encourage someone uh, who's involved or, or who's interested in getting involved in you know social justice and creating change and becoming a change maker, maker in their community. Uh, one, join EYJ. Uh, there's there's plenty of room for you, uh, but also you know just don't be afraid to get out there. There's nothing too small that you can do to help make a difference. Yeah, very cool. And and if people want to get involved, if their voice is um, you know an artistic way, and, and Keith, uh, sing the praises of twelve literary arts and how people can find the organization you're representing tonight. Yay. Um, so you can actually hit us up on our website, 12arts.org, and you can get in contact with literally anyone on the staff. Uh, you, we have our we have our phone numbers on there, our emails on there. Uh, I think we also have some Instagram handles on there as well. Um, and and similar to uh, E Y E J. Now you guys say you guys do you guys say I J? I would say I J. I J. <laughs> but um, but uh, similar to uh. EYEJ, um, if you uh, hit us up on any of our social media handles, we will respond with swiftness and with blindness. So, yeah. And to Absolutely. any young person that's trying to get more involved in their own community on like a, I don't know, on an individual, on an individual tip, uh, what I would say is uh, that conversations with the phone can only go so far. That's only the first step. Um, and I would tell them that there's a real life out there. Like that there's not just marching going on in Ferguson or going on downtown Cleveland or marching. There's more, there's so many more ways to get involved in the community. Um, outreach has so many different 
roles for people, that there's space for every single gift, there's space for every single thing that you have. And the best way to start is looking in your own community. What is around you? What what um, rec centers are around you? Because they will know who to get in contact with. You know what I'm saying? So just, just that's that's what I would say. Just look, instead of looking here, look here and you'll find a lot more. I love all the messages you have tonight and uh, this conversation has lived up uh, to all the anticipation and excitement that I have for it. I am in awe of the three of you uh, for all that you do and I thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, these organizations are about empowerment, uplift and inclusion. And by all means, if anyone is watching at home tonight, uh, like the three of them have said, reach out, reach out. These are incredible individuals doing big things in small ways for their communities. And we are so fortunate that we have a young generation of leaders and change makers coming up uh, to make Cleveland an even better place than it is. So I, I thank you all, McClellan, Keith, Treya, uh, for being our guest tonight. And again, if you are uh, joining us on the Cleveland Public Library's Facebook page. Please share this. It'll live there in perpetuity. And we do this every single month as we focus on racial equity and justice and uh, making this corner of the world a better place. So for the Cleveland Public Library and 19 News, I'm Chris Tanaka saying thank you to our panelists. Thank you for joining us for another digital discussion. Have a great evening.